So what is your job? I'm a nurse, I'm a mental health nurse, and I work as a nurse consultant and I specialise in suicide prevention. Cool. How did you become that? Well, I've been a nurse for many years. I started my training in 1989. And I think I always had a bit of an interest in... Ages ago. <laughs> yeah, I know, I'm old. Always had a bit of an interest in suicide. So I've got old projects that I did in my training that were on yeah. suicide. Um, and obviously in mental health, it's something that we, all, we whatever field we work in, we all need to be mindful of it. So why do people take their own lives? I think it's really complex and there's lots and lots of reasons and it's different for everybody. Um, so what we know from the research is that people who have certain things happen to them in their lives are more vulnerable than others. Um, and that could be people that have got a mental illness or a history of mental illness or they've been through really bad trauma. Yeah. Um, you know, there's certain factors that make it worse, like alcohol, drugs. Um, feeling a total lack of belonging is a really important part. Uh, I think when people are feeling suicidal, when they're having suicidal thoughts, they genuinely believe that nobody cares yeah. um, and that they're just a burden and that everybody would be better off without them. And that's never true, but it feels true to the people that are going yeah. through it. And I guess if they're depressed and have had awful things happen to them, you know, it's going to feel all the more real. Yeah. And people that, where there's a family history of suicide, that can sometimes be um, a risk factor for people. But, you know, there are hundreds of risk factors out there. So I might have 80 risk factors and you might have 80 risk factors and they might be the same ones, but I might have some thoughts of suicide and you might not. You know, it's, it's, yeah. sort of, it's, it's down to the person and the individual. Yeah, it's not, yeah, the facts. Yeah, yeah. It's like with siblings as well, isn't it? You see it, it's like the same traumatic events happen to both siblings and then only one sort of struggles with it a lot more than the other, so about yeah. how you can process it and stuff. So that bit, I think, you know, when you're thinking of helping people, you have to understand the person. It's not enough just to understand the risk factors. You've got to understand the person so that you can sort of tie the two of them together and understand why those risk factors yeah. make this person feel this way. Is, like, suicide thought of as a separate mental health problem or is it sort of just a side effect or, like, an outcome of it, if you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Most people who take their lives aren't in touch with mental health services. Um, so some people would say that actually everybody who takes their lives, or 95% of people who take their lives, have a diagnosable mental disorder at the time of their death. And other people say, no, I don't think that's true. I think that you know, when someone's going through awful things in their life, it could be situational, it could be impulsive, it could, maybe it isn't always to do with mental illness. So I don't think it's a disorder on its own. Um, certain disorders have a higher likelihood of suicide. Yeah. So if you're depressed, you're more likely to have suicidal thoughts than someone who isn't depressed. Yeah. So do you think that social media links at all into it? What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I think social media can be really harmful. But I also think it can be quite helpful. See, at my age, I'm, I probably have a more negative attitude towards social yeah. media than you do. You know, what I read and what I see is that some people are really badly affected when it's cyberbullying or something or fear of missing out or yeah. going to sites that have got pictures you know yeah. of someone self-harming and stuff yeah and I think as well for me like because of my age like I don't really like how it is on social media and I, I do see it as quite a negative thing but then I also can't imagine not using it like yeah so like, when I was at school you know if I was bullied I would go home and I could leave it behind yeah and now of course that yeah. doesn't happen it's 24 7 um so that's an issue um, the fear of missing out, I think, as well, is, is yeah. coming up. And that might link with bullying. If, you, if you're isolated, if people yeah. aren't in, including you, um, you, know, you're, you know what you're missing out on because it's yeah, all over. Yeah, you can see it, yeah. yeah. And you can see a much better version of it yeah. <laughs> on social media. Yeah. And if you're already feeling bad about yourself, um, because nobody who has suicidal thoughts feels good about themselves, yeah. then it's just going to make it worse. And then there's also all of the stuff that's out there on the internet, you know, yeah. that kind of encourages it sometimes or, or, or maybe glamorises it. And I think that is quite risky and quite dangerous. Yeah, definitely. But, you know, at the same time, we, social media isn't going to go away. So we need to think about how we can 
make it more helpful for people. Yeah. So they have done certain things now, like if you Google something about suicide, yeah. then the first thing that should come up is, do you need help? Yeah. You're not alone. Yeah. And I think one of like the biggest social media problems was Instagram. Mm. And I think that they've changed a lot of their settings as well to come up as a sort of like, um, you know, warning before you see images or whatever. So... I think that's quite good. Yeah, that is good. I don't use Instagram. Have you seen? Yeah, you know, it comes up. It has. It's called um, sense screen. So like they censor the images before they're seen. But I think they're really good. But mm. then you can always just click past it and go see anyway. Mm. So, but it is a step. It is a step. I think it's an important step because if you think that, you know, when someone's struggling with suicidal thoughts and they believe that nobody cares, yeah. these little things, in to my mind, they they're kind of saying that we do care. That's why we don't want you to see this stuff. Yeah. Or this is why we're saying, look, Samaritans can help you or, yeah. or Childline can help you. And I think that's it. It's like people seeking support in the wrong places. Mm. So when public figures like take their own lives, how do you think that is portrayed in the media? Is it portrayed well or is it slightly controversial? <laughs> I think it's variable, isn't it? Um, there's a lot of media guidance nowadays because what, what we know, what we've learnt is that when the media is irresponsible in how it reports these things, so if it reports saying this famous person killed himself because this was happening in his life, yeah. this is how he did it, um, and it's kind of sensationalising it, yeah. then that, we know that that can be quite dangerous. And people that they feel that they've got similarities in their life yeah. and they're already vulnerable, um, they might be influenced by it. You have to already be vulnerable. It's not going yeah. to influence you if you're not. But if you are, then it, it can. But I think what we need more of in the press is stuff like people who come through yeah. difficult times. And public figures can be quite helpful then. Do you have like an opinion on the idea that a lot of people do just do it for attention? Um, I think sometimes people have needs. They need to be heard, they need to be understood, and they need to feel cared about. Um, and that could be a motive for self-harm. Um, but I would never say that people are just doing it, um, you know, for a kick or, or for attention. You know, if people need attention, they need attention, don't they? Yeah. I think we've got into a really bad habit of calling people attention seekers. Yeah. And it's just not, not right. There's always a reason why somebody would do that. If they were happy and OK, they wouldn't do it. So, like I said, you know, when people always say they, they feel like they could have done more, blah, 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 and they blame themselves. Do you, do you think there's signs as such for like people to look out for? The standards that the signs that, that we would tell people to look out for might be that someone's more isolated, they're not really talking to you, they're preoccupied, um, they're irritable. Maybe they're doing things they wouldn't normally do, like drinking more or getting into fights or arguing. Or maybe they're doing other things like giving things away or just having conversations where it's obvious they're not thinking about the future or they're thinking about or they're not maybe they are talking about death and dying and suicide or maybe they're just being quite final in what they're what they're yeah. talking about and it's quite difficult because it's not like one day you're absolutely fine and then the next day you've got all of their, those yeah. signs they're they're so gradual sometimes you don't realize them but it's i think it's that disconnect yeah, that sort of break within. Yeah. So how would you approach that to said person, you know, anyone who was sort of suffering? Would you be upfront and direct with them or would you sort of go about it a bit more subtly, I guess? Do you, is there sort of a, a, a go-to method of talking about it? I think the, I think the go-to is not, don't avoid it. I think how we talk about it would depend. So if I was worried about my daughter, I would probably come straight out with it. Yeah. But if I was worried about um, my friend's daughter, I might be a little bit more gradual. So yeah. I might say, you don't seem yourself. You know, you, actually, you seem as though you're really quite unhappy. I feel a bit worried about you. I'd yeah. try and get them to talk to me about it. Yeah. And if I kept saying things, seeing things, then I would eventually get there. And I'd say, do you know what? I, I just feel really concerned about you. I'm, yeah. I'm worried that maybe you're sort of thinking of harming yourself or... Do you, do you feel like ending it all ever? Yeah. I don't think we can tell people what is the right and wrong thing to say. But yeah. what we can say is do not avoid it. So like you said, if you, if you would say, I'm, I'm worried about you or I'm worried about this happening to you, do you reckon it would put 
the idea in people's heads as such, instead of helping them, you know? No. You don't think? And we know that because there has been research done into it. Um, and actually what we've learned from people is that if you ask them about suicide, it is not going to put the idea in their head because it, it may well already be there. Yeah. Um, and if it isn't there, it d it's not going to pop in just because you've talked about it. But it gives people permission. Yeah. You know, if someone is feeling that they can't talk to anybody, nobody cares, and someone says, even if it was a bit clumsy, even if I did go straight up to someone and say, look, are you thinking about suicide? Yeah. Um, it still might just help them think, yes, I am, you know. And it, it straight away it gives them permission to yeah. talk about it. Gives them that space, that sort mm. of safe space. So it's better to be clumsy than not do it at all. Yeah, true. So do some people end up sort of killing themselves when they don't mean to? I think that can happen, but I guess we have to be careful about making assumptions because really the only person that can tell us isn't here anymore. One of the saddest things I remember is somebody that I nursed um, who did die and he d it was a self-inflicted death. And, I, and it was years and years and years ago and he was a young lad, but I 100% believe he didn't mean to kill himself. I think he was really struggling, he was in a really difficult place, he had lots of thoughts um, that he wasn't worth anything, but I don't think he wanted to die, but he was testing it out. Um, I think there was sort of practicing there, but not definite intent. Yeah. So my belief is that sometimes people can die when they don't 100% want to, and it's in that bit before when they're, they're not sure. Yeah. And, and so, so I it's would say... It's sort of just reckless as such, yeah. Yeah. And it doesn't mean that they're fine. It doesn't mean they're pretending. It doesn't mean that there aren't some issues we need to help them with. Yeah. But I don't think they always want to die. Like yeah. we think things aren't dangerous, but they actually really are. And you can just be, you know, you can do it all the time. Think, oh, I always do this. I always do that. I'll be fine. And then one day you're not. Mm. And you never know when or when that won't happen. Mm. And I think it's so, there's no, there's no way of telling ever really, if you're doing dangerous things and but you're not doing it with such intent, I think it's very risky business. Like, There's a myth, isn't there, that if people talk about suicide, they don't really mean it. Yeah. And if people sort of keep trying but don't really manage to do it, then they don't really want to do it. Yeah. And we need to get over those myths because it, it's very, very dangerous. And people are scared of what they don't know and understand, aren't they? And it's, it's difficult to understand something like suicide because inherently humans have a massive kind of sense of self-preservation. And yeah. so that is conflicted by the, the thought of wanting to end your life. And, and it's that, that makes people quite frightened and they can't understand it. Um, and so that also, I think, fuels the, the stigma, doesn't it? Yeah, definitely. So sometimes I think, you know, that's why we should think about in these simple ways that if someone is feeling like that, the things that they are definitely thinking is nobody cares, Bet, everyone would be better off if they're dead and they're just worthless and, and a burden. And if we just think of those simple things, what can we do to help someone feel a little bit better? Yeah. We can say, look, I, I really do care about you and I'm so worried about you, I want to yeah. get some help. The, the message is I would hope that we can try and give people who are struggling is that even though it feels like nobody cares, there is always someone that cares. Yeah. And even if it isn't a family member or, or a friend at that moment in time, there, is, there are hundreds of volunteers. There, yeah. Nobody volunteers to do these things unless they care. Um, what I've learned from working with people that have survived suicide attempts and who've come through feeling suicidal is that if only they'd realised there were people there, if only they realised that people cared and if only someone had helped them understand that. So I think that's a message that we've got to get across. I, I think as well... Suicidal moments, if you like, are, they tend to be transient. So, so I think most people that struggle with suicidal thoughts, you can imagine how exhausting that is. You, you, you feel desperate, you feel awful, you feel lonely, you feel all of those terrible things. So that's exhausting. And it, it's not constantly there. So people do rest. It, you know, it, they are transient. And so I would always encourage people to remember that as well. And sometimes it's not about what can stop me being suicidal, it's what can get me through this moment. Yeah, um, until it's a bit easier again. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 and if we 
help people understand that they will be transient. Let's get through this moment. And then when, I'm, when I've got through it, you know, reflect on it and sort of think, how can I try and prevent it happening again? That's, for me, that's, that's the way forward, really. There are many organisations that work in lots of different ways to help prevent suicide. CALM, Campaign Against Living Miserably, are one such organisation. So what is CALM? We view suicide as the barometer on how society is doing. Um, and right now, there are 18 people every day that choose to take their own life. Now, last year, there were only 16. So that shows there's an 11% increase year on year. And that says to us that there's something dangerously worrying happening. So what CALM does is campaigns uh, for societal and personal change. So to try to prevent suicide, to try to bring people hope and a happier life. Uh, we run a thing called collectives, which is groups of people who do stuff together, like running and cycling and football and stuff. And we bring people together as a community. Uh, and most importantly, we run uh, a helpline from five to midnight, seven days a week, where we help people who have either got to a point of crisis and they need us, or we'll help people on that helpline who aren't at that stage yet but might be in danger of doing so or indeed will help people who are worried about somebody else. Yeah what does it look like if you um, phone the helpline what's happening on the other end I guess? Well there's two things you can do you can talk on the phone but for a lot of people they don't want to do that for a lot of people they want to type so whether you're talking or whether you're using our web chat service which you can find on our website uh, you will uh, there'll be a queue um, when you get through that queue you will get through to uh, the next available helpline worker. Um, that helpline worker will listen to what's happening in your life, uh, will take a lot of notes while they're doing that. And uh, it's just absolutely anonymous, by the way, so we never take names, we'll never, we never take cell phone numbers. What we'll do is we'll work through where you are now and where you want to get to, and we'll start to help put plans in place to, to, to achieve that. It might be that you just need you just want to talk to someone, um, in which case we'll do that as well. Uh, and it's, it's, I went and visited the helpline, which is in the north of England, um, in Blackburn and Preston. Uh, and I found it really touching that what I always thought was that our helpline was really there right on the front line preventing suicide, uh, which indeed it is. But what I also was uh, privileged to listen into, but not to the callers, but to the yeah. helpline workers talking, was, for example, a call from somebody who just really needed a chat uh, and was talking about what they were going to have for dinner that night. And, and I said to the, the helpline worker, or the woman that, that, that runs it, um, that, that's not what I expected. I, you know, is this really what calm is there for? And, and her point was that if we weren't there for this guy to talk about just what was happening in his life, then where's he going to be tomorrow? And where's he going to be the day after that? Yeah. Because he's very lonely and he doesn't have anybody to talk to. So really, we'll... We, we'll we are so completely non-judgmental that our anonymous and free to call helpline uh, will we'll, we'll help you whatever it is you need to be helped with. With the exception of we, we are not clinical, so we're not trained uh, psychotherapists, we're not trained psychiatrists, so we will refer on if there's a clinical issue. Um, but fundamentally what we do in trying to change behaviour is, uh, uh, is talking, to people, checking in with people, looking out for people if there are major lifestyle changes that happen to them, uh, if people start to become isolated. And then again, we look at high risk groups. So we look at, for example, men in their 30s uh, are shown very clearly that friendships wane when they get into their 30s and they become isolated. So we do a lot of work, for example, uh, with, with, with men talking about how you can be a good mate. So on Dave, you know, T Dave TV, yeah. it's called, it, our yeah. campaign with them is be the mate you'd want. It's just, it's a bit like, please leave this toilet as you wish to find it. It's like, um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's imagine what kind of mate you want and try yeah. to be that. Um, and we, 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 we campaign for change, but also we help people with lots of materials on our website about how we might come together more cohesively and, and perhaps more kindly to look after people, especially in pretty turbulent times. What's your kind of, what's Calm's approach with um younger people as the help run only open to adults or is it open oh, no, absolutely to not age no 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 it's completely anybody can call uh, the, the, the numbers that came out last month um, the government official numbers uh, show that um, the again as it has been for a long time three quarters of 
suicides are in men in their 40s and 50s, but terrifyingly young people as a group are growing for the first time uh, in over 10 years, um, that the suicide rate is increasing in that group higher than in any other group. Obviously you've said a little bit, but how do you think CALMS and CALMS Helpline and CALMS, what they do is different, I guess, from other it's that approach. Uh, our helpline is really different to other helplines in that we have paid, trained people, professional people who are highly what's called interventionist. So what we will do, our helpline workers will do, is they are incredibly non-judgmental uh, and they will listen to people, find out what's happening in their lives and their training means that they're very well equipped to deal with whole variety of issues from addiction to homelessness to loneliness to all the things that might come across people's lives and that's that's a point of difference in, our, in the service that we provide. If you're worried about someone and you think they're considering suicide talk to them about it. They need to know someone is listening. If you're thinking about suicide please reach out to someone. It might be friends, family, it might be on a web chat or a helpline because you are not a burden and this will pass. As well as your GP or local mental health team, there are many organisations and charities who can help you if you're feeling suicidal. You can find a list in the links underneath this film.